and uh, especially during this, uh, what the first preface of our Lenten Mass tells us, that this is a joyous season. Yet, most of us are so sad looking during Lent. You know, and I said uh, when I was sharing something about the, a list of things that our Holy Father came out with about fasting, it was very interesting because it didn't have anything to do with food or sugar or alcohol or cigarettes. Let's face it, when we give those things up, we are miserable with people that we live with. <laughs> but he talks about fasting from ugly words, fasting and not speaking kindly about others. Fasting from gossiping. And he goes through, you can imagine it, uh, the list that he's going through. And recognizing the signs of the times that we find ourselves in, I think Lent has a lot to yell at us about. Especially when we listen to the sacred scriptures, which are all about joyful encounters with Jesus. And I was always puzzled as a young priest about giving out prayer for a penance. Did you ever think of that? <laughs> Say three Hail Marys and three Our Fathers and three Glory Bees. And then I remember my dad, who was an FBI agent, and my mother was a tax collector. That's why I'm 100% my father and 100% my mother, but they've both gone to the Lord, and it's my stomach that's a wreck all the time. <laughs> and I remember one time they went to reconciliation, and of course my mom was on the parish council. She didn't want to go to the pastor or the priest in the parish because they'd know right away who she was. And so they stopped at the parish we used to be a part of on the way out to dinner. And... My mother looks at my father after they both came out of the church, and mom says to dad, did you get a strange penance? And realizing my dad's background, he said yes, but he volunteered no other information. <laughs> so she said, well, what was the penance? And he said to give up ice cream for a week. And my mother looked at him and said, did you tell him you don't eat ice cream? <laughs> no, he didn't ask. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, I want to reflect on tonight. Lent as a divine conspiracy, since conspiracy theories seem to be relevant in our day and age. And they were in the time of Jesus as well. It's what put him on a cross. And when I say that, a divine conspiracy, and then I think of words that we hear so often in Lent of forgiveness, ha, compassion, mercy, and unconditional love. Those are the messages of Lent and all of our gospel passages during Lent, no matter what cycle we're in, speak to that. Lent is a time for you and me to wallow in our sinfulness. But sometimes we need to look at the counterpoint to that, because that gets us nowhere. It can even lead to depression in our lives. When we think about how, un how unworthy I am of God's love, we need to get out of that mentality. We are worthy of God's love because you and I are created in the image and the likeness of God. And that's what Lent is about for us, to remember that. That we're created in God's image and likeness. We all come to Mass and we know we're sinners. It's the first thing we do when we begin our Eucharistic celebration, is remind ourselves of our sinfulness so that we can be open to good news in our lives. And so that we can go out and personify 
the presence of Jesus to others. Lent is a time for you and me to, in acknowledging our sinfulness, but even more importantly, to remind ourselves of just how much God loves us. And that we are embraced by God every time we come together. When we listen to the word of God during this time, that our God is a loving God, a merciful God, and nowhere do we see Jesus placing conditions upon forgiveness. And if we go into the confessional all of the time and say, well, bless me, Father, for I and all that stuff that we remember since we were three or four years old, <laughs> and we say, well, Father, it's the same thing I'm confessing over and over again. There's something that needs to happen in somebody's life because when you are forgiven and you come back and say the same thing again, we're saying, and I sometimes will point to the cross at Mass and say, haven't you accepted that in your life? Jesus died once, and he died for all of us. And our lives are about celebrating that love unconditionally. And whether we're at Mass or going to confession, we go to confession because we know we've screwed up in our relationship with God, and our, more importantly, our relationship with others, and even more importantly, with ourselves that we're going because I want to do this and I want to do that, and I don't. So our hearts are contrite, and that's where it all begins for us. And by experiencing this limitless compassion, mercy, forgiveness, our hearts are in the right place. The challenge for us is, are we able to do that in our relationships with one another? Isn't it so easy to be kind to everyone? When you look at the evening news, I sometimes say to youth groups or to a parents so recently at another parish, you know, your kids know your values by how you respond to things on the news. They begin to know what they can and cannot talk to you about if they get in a jam because of how you respond to the news. And when we look at that, how empowering is the gospel in our lives to show mercy, compassion, and we say all are welcome. I love that song in the church, but it's not true. It is not true that all are welcome because once someone identifies themselves as just a little out of the box, they're judged. And those are issues that are deep in our hearts that we have to examine because when we come face to face with our God, it's going to be about how we loved others. It's going to be about the Beatitudes. And those are going to be the important things in our lives. Jesus' time was filled with a lot of conspiracies. Isn't that what got him crucified? People's insecurity that he just might be the Son of God? Enabling the deaf to hear, the blind to see, the lame to walk. But that wasn't enough. It made people feel all the more insecure. And even we priests have to examine our own lives to make sure that our heart is in the right place when we preside at Eucharist so that we can be messengers of good news. People do not need to be reminded of their sinfulness. We just did that at the beginning of the liturgy. They need to be reminded of how much they're loved. 
without any limitations. If Jesus places no limitations on that love, then who are we to do that? I'd like to use two examples quickly as I go through. The gospel passage we had last week, the woman at the well. And that experience of Jesus encountering this woman was not an accident. And people who aren't like us, who come into our lives, I believe, are not accidents. It's the Holy Spirit hopefully bringing someone into a relationship with others where they can experience that compassion, that mercy, that forgiveness. There's a reason she comes. I'm not going to read the gospel because that would take half of my talk. <laughs> we know the story. She's walking alone to the well in the middle of the day. And in that time, people did not go in the middle of the day to get water and not alone. She was not welcomed by the other women in town who went in the early hours of the morning in the coolness of the day. She wasn't welcome to do that. And she was marginalized. And that's an important piece for us to realize because sometimes this is the struggle in our church today on a variety of issues. And I stand in awe of the margins that want to be at the table of the Lord and their perseverance in a church that sometimes through its people and sometimes the institution itself Rules and regulations do not let them feel welcomed. Divorced and remarried. Unwanted pregnancy in people's lives. LGBT issues. And the list goes on. You know, I remember growing up as a young kid, that's getting longer ago, and my aunt got divorced. And I was the first grandchild. My sister, I, was, I was the prince until my sister rolled around. <laughs> and we were almost warned about going over to my aunt's house after she was divorced. And I, you get this sense that it was like she was contagious with something because it was so unheard of back in those days. I remember the late 60s and 70s when some parents were ashamed that their daughters who were sisters or young men who were priests left the priesthood. They had to change parishes because they felt ashamed. How do we deal with these things in our society today? And yet the well has a very important piece to this. The Jacob's well. Because it transcends genera generations. And the joy of this gospel is they meet in a place that unites them together. First of all, she's a Samaritan. Jesus shouldn't even be talking to her. And Samaritan, Jews and Samaritans didn't talk. They were like another cult because they worshipped God on a different mountain but they were still Jews in the depths of their hearts. She could have been stoned to death for talking to Jesus because she was alone with someone who was not her husband. A powerful reminder for us. Rules and regulations can have severe consequences in people's lives. I'm old enough to remember when Father Ritchie was making the uh, announcement before about we can eat meat on, you know, uh, St. Patrick's Day. And of course, I'm fully Irish, but I'm probably going to have something else anyway. <laughs> and I say to myself, just think back to before the council when we were told by sister in classrooms that we'd go to hell if we ate meat on Fridays. Just remember when we were offered the option 
of receiving the Eucharist on our hands after Vatican II. When we had grown up, well, in some ways we did, in some ways we didn't, when we grew up with the understanding that you can't touch the bread in your mouth because you'd be chewing the body of Jesus. And we wondered why people had great hesitancy of taking the bread in their hands. Rules and regulations can be transcended when it's done in the name of mercy, compassion, forgiveness, and unconditional love. Many things that are not all that welcomed in our society today and sometimes even in our own church. I remember in the second interview that our Holy Father Francis gave in Rome. The interview was conducted by an atheist and he turned and one of the first questions he asked the Holy Father was, who is the real Papa Bergoglio? which is the way they refer to the Pope all the time in Italy. And the only thing Francis thought about in silence, he responded, I am a sinner. As we look at this woman, everyone knew everything about her. That's why she walked to the well alone. But in her encounter with Jesus, he listened her into existence. And isn't that what synodality really is all about in our lives today that we find awkward to deal with? And I remember when a very long homily by Apollos at the seminary when I was a seminarian, and one of the phrases he came out with, which was one I just said, you can listen a person into existence. And Roe, isn't that what you do in youth ministry? You listen to these kids' stories when we used to get one, I was up at Lake Tahoe with the group. I was usually the oldest one there, but that it brought back a lot of life into me. But we can listen to people. It's the one thing we're not doing enough. We always feel we're on the defensive. Would Jesus hang out with you if he walked around today? Because he always seemed to go to the ones that were on the, the margins, the peripheries not the ones that were all concerned about others' behavior. And so the joy of the gospel here is that both the woman and Jesus have something that each other desires. A drink of water and a life. And she's looking for love, as the song goes, in all the wrong places. She's on number five. And the one she's living with is not her husband. Look at today. Is that any different in some ways? You know, we've had people run for office that are on number three. Others that were in various roles in government are on number three. How does that make us feel? The woman is rightly resistant, giving mutual, the mutual perceived lack of respect for what she has experienced in her own life. She feels bad. Just imagine walking to the well by herself in the heat of the day, and she's probably walking along thinking about how bad she is, that she's doing this by herself in the heat of the day. And then she encounters this man that she doesn't know, but he knows everything about her. You see, we may not be the woman sitting at the well, but Jesus does know everything about us and our lives. And so as we look at this transformation that goes on in her life, She goes back into town, and she shouts out to them, I've met someone that's told me everything I have ever done. Of course, they knew that already. (laughs) Come and see, she says to them. They didn't encounter Jesus at the well. He appears later. 
Come and see. A powerful reminder. And she's often referred to as the first evangelist. A woman of all things in her time. It's not the first time a woman announces the good news. And so the joy of this passage is that Jesus is offering her and all of us as disciples something much greater than we experience now. You see, sometimes when I'm working with priests and priest convocations and things, I often say, be very careful referring to everyone in church as a disciple. It's not true. It's not synonymous with being a parishioner. We talk about fans and followers. We talk about fans that keep following people around the country. And then they embrace the message themselves and they no longer have to keep going to the events. What did we call those in scripture? Followers, believers, and disciples. But there's only one opportunity for each of us to truly become a disciple. And it's not talking about it. It's not going to scripture study all of the time. It's not saying the rosary all of the time. It's a personal encounter with the face of Jesus Christ. It's a red line. And unless we have that encounter with Jesus, as this woman did in the gospel, we don't become a disciple. And I believe that's also sometimes prevalent in the priesthood as well. We were never taught how to be disciples. And it affects our preaching. Because if we have that personal encounter like this woman does in the gospel, how can our lives continue to be normal? with all of the parameters we put on ourselves of what normalcy is, she was a normal disciple when she ran into town. She couldn't contain the message. She was on fire. And I remember, Ro, when we used to gather here after the DYR retreat up at Tahoe, and for me, just to listen to the stories of our youth, it was the youth leaders that were here, to listen to the stories of what they heard from their youth up there. Those retreats were phenomenal to me and gave me hope. And I share it because seeing Ro, it kind of brings back those memories. But I think people, young people preparing for confirmation were not allowed to come to these retreats. All the participants were from youth groups in their parishes with responsible youth leaders that they respected. They wanted to be there. We're confirmandi. They're in the program just because mom and dad are making them come to the program. They could care less about it, and you're not going to see them again until maybe if they're getting married. You know, I mean, but these young people, brothers and sisters, we are grounded with good survival behind us. And I think that's a powerful piece to, for us. And Jesus offers her living water. You see, Lent, sisters and brothers, is not as much for us. Lent was created to journey with those who are seeking the sacraments of life. And that's why they're central, those in the RCIA as they approach the fullness of life in the waters of baptism and Eucharist and confirmation. And the whole concept was we journey with them in prayer and discernment and we become beneficiaries to their journey of intimacy with the Lord. The RCIA has the power to truly transform our parishes. The unfortunate thing is we're in a class mentality so often. And at the end of the RCIA, they become like the rest of us rather than the community they experienced 
throughout the discernment process, the power to transform that. The question for us is, are we open to encountering the presence of Jesus in our lives? I remember in a catechetical session that our Holy Father was giving in the great audience hall, and he was speaking about prayer. This is a couple of lengths ago. And he says, we all pray for things to happen. I'm asking you to remember that you're the answer to the prayer. See, we expect God to do everything. That's, isn't that the MO in most of our prayer life? God to do this, God to do that, God to get rid of COVID when all you had to do was take vaccines. <laughs> Don't throw anything at me. But isn't that reality in our lives? Common sense issues, and yet we don't always respond that way. Have we encountered Jesus this past week? Do we take the time to be nurtured by the Word of God when we go back home and have that cup of coffee? I wanted to get together with Linda and have a cup of coffee, and then she invited me to come here. <laughs> We're always trying a different coffee shop, Frank and, and, and Linda. And she's, well, I've got something to talk to you about. You know, we need, you know, and, um, and Eric and Richard are on for next week. But I, so I said, well, be assured, I'm not singing tonight. But anyway. Yeah. But have we encountered the Lord? Many of us have. What we need to do in Lent is to stoke that encounter in each of our lives. So it doesn't go out, that flame in our lives that gives us all purpose. You know, I sometimes stood in awe of this when I was a young person, still living at home in high school. We moved out to Long Island from the Bronx. I worked very hard on my accent. Um, <laughs> getting rid of it, that is. It slips through once in a while if I get excited. But I fight getting it back when I go home. But on a Saturday morning, my mother always had a knack. She said, Johnny, why don't you go answer the door? And I said, why? She said, well, there's somebody coming up the driveway, two people, Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> but you know, sisters and brothers, I stand in awe of that. Every single youth in the Mormon Church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints must do a missionary session. And it's tough. But you know what? Their hearts are on fire and they have people who support them. And they go out two by two, just like Jesus told his first disciples. And be prepared, you're not all going to be welcome. It happened not too long ago where I live, in downtown San Jose. Beautiful Saturday morning. And I was going over to a parish to do something and happened to be dressed like this. And I answered the door. And they had to change their script because the one thing they start with is, do you believe in Jesus Christ? <laughs> And uh, I said, I really do. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, isn't that, who are, let me put it this way, who are the Samaritan women in our day? Any ideas, raise, let me know. Any ideas of who the Samaritan woman would be if we put that in a diff different setting? Homeless, the immigrants, the immigrants. All, all of us, LGBT. LGBT, the divorced, and more especially if they're remarried, because being divorced is no obstacle to participating fully in the life of the church. It's the remarriage piece that is the, creates an obstacle. Mentally the mentally ill. Single mothers, 
the incarcerated. Someone who's had an abortion doesn't feel welcome to come to the church, or someone that may have assisted in some medical procedures and stuff like that. Those that profess their faith in our current culture, I think, are outcasts. Our current yeah. culture. Right. Be feeling as an outcast in our own culture as a believer because that's what I'm talking about in this conspiracy issue. That's. It's just not a message that's welcome today. What's the most surprising thing about this gospel passage? You're not asking us to give up something, you're asking us to do something. Right. It's not about giving up something, it's doing something as she goes back into... And does Jesus get into the mess of her life? No, but he juxtaposes her journey and sends her in a different direction. That it becomes part of her heart, not just her head. You see, sometimes, I've sometimes thought of this, and I said, you know, I go back far enough for the Baltimore Catechism and how much we love God. We must love the Lord our God with our whole heart, our whole mind, and our whole soul. My problem with that is most of us have remained compartmentalized ever since. You know, we love the Lord our God in our head. Well, we're great in the head part. But when it comes to the heart, it puts stress in our lives. And if I were to rewrite that today, and of course no one's asking me if I would, but if I were to write that today, I would say we need to love the Lord our God with our DNA. And when I've seen young people and have experienced many young Catholics in the Diocese of San Jose, they get it. They get it because, like the woman, when she runs into town, she's filled with joy. And when they come down from Tahoe, it lasts a period, and the youth ministers continue to cultivate the experience from up on the hill and by the lake. This coming weekend, we have a different gospel. And these are three gospels. I'm not only going to talk about this other one, and then we'll just open it up. And this one is about the man born blind. And you know that story. Often pictured as sitting on the side of the temple, dirty, alone, steeped in his own misery, no one stopping to offer him anything. He basically isn't even welcome to be in his own home because of the book of Leviticus. And so what is the question that the disciples put to Jesus when they see this blind person sitting along the temple? Teacher, is it this man's sin or the sin of his parents that he was born blind? Now think back 60, 70, 80, 90 years ago. What did we do with many people who were born with an infirmity? We isolated them. We created asylums for the blind, the deaf, the mute, the disabled, because Leviticus attributed all of that to the sin of the parents. And so, you know, if people want to steep themselves in the Old Testament issues, read the book of Leviticus, and you'll jump to the New Testament pretty quickly. <laughs> You know, and I think it's a powerful image for us that this man was born blind. And what does Jesus say? Teacher, is it this man's sin or the sin of his parents? And Jesus says, neither. The first theological dispute that Jesus is justifiably opposing something in sacred scripture.
because he's not going along with what Leviticus is saying. Think of the people Jesus hung around or reached out to to exemplify what God's unconditional love is about. Someone isolated because the rules of church or the synagogue or the Jewish faith. And then we have to look at what are some of those things in our own church today. You know, we talk about real presence, sisters and brothers. But only 26% of Catholics today believe in real presence. I firmly believe in real presence when we come together and celebrate Eucharist. And we become bearers of that presence when we leave the church. As I sometimes say at the end of Mass, go and be the face of Jesus to others. But I do come from New York, and I always remember my father on a Sunday morning after Mass, looking at everybody trying to get out of the parking lot. <laughs> and he would put his arm across the steering wheel and say, see how they love one another. <laughs> you know, horns are, you know, New Yorkers love horns, but that sense that we have. We do have some rules and regulations that doesn't mean we marginalize and isolate people and say they are not welcomed. But my point is, if we truly believe in real presence, it's what Pope Francis said in, his, in the apostolic exhortation, the joy of the gospel. It's not a prize for the perfect, but powerful medicine for the weak. I used to say, I was nice when Pope Francis agreed with me because the way I used to say it before he came out with his words of wisdom was the Eucharist is not a reward for a job well done. It is not a prize for the perfect because none of us are, but it's powerful medicine for the weak. And if someone struggles in their faith, who are we to judge? And if they receive the Eucharist, is it not just a possibility that Jesus can transform their lives into his own image and likeness again? And I think that's what we have to reflect on. The blind man was ostracized by his parents because it would be a reflection on them. The reason he was begging, he was basically disowned. How many stories have we heard from young people today that aren't welcomed in the house because they're LGBTQ? Or they're not welcomed in the house because all of a sudden the young daughter is pregnant? Or not welcomed into the house because they're not dating the right kind of person? I know none of you have ever ha heard of these kinds of experiences. <laughs> and we wonder why there's such a high rate of teenage suicide. And I have presided at way too many of those funerals. And I'll do everything I can to make sure that they have an ear and they can be empowered through their weakness. Because even St. Paul tells us, I tend to quote him as a Paulist often, through our weakness, power reaches perfection. He was totally dependent on others. I often wonder in the story, did the disciples give the, beg the blind man anything? For him, there was no light in the world. Yet maybe there was just a spark of light as he's listening to this conversation going on around him. And like the Samaritan woman in the gospel, everyone in town knew who he was, and for the most part, steered clear of him. One of the great challenges for him is he had already become complacent in his own status in life. And sometimes when we reach out to individuals like that, isn't that one of the greatest difficulties? Is helping them to see an alternative to the life that they're experiencing, just like the Samaritan woman at the well. 
He is the perfect person to experience the joy of the gospel, the words of Jesus. I remember when I was in college, in my second year down in Florida, and one of the sociology experiments we had to do is we had to wear a mask around our eyes for one week. Of course, when it first started, there were a lot of jokes. And after a while, it became the norm. We went to class with that on. All of a sudden, we realized that the books are useless to us. And teach profs had been warned that this was going to happen, so be patient. It's something different. You know, trying to go to church on Sunday morning when that was a minority of students, but I was contemplating the seminary at that point. And I think it all of a sudden made me much more aware of what difficulties people have. And you know, so many, when you've, some of you I know have gone on pilgrimages with Father Brendan in the past and things like that, and you realize how non-ADA other countries are. Just getting into them, buildings, is a challenge. And then I remember a story and I, I, uh, from a movie, and I can't ever remember the name of the movie. But it's about two college students getting together at campus, and they meet each other. One of them's blind, handsome guy, blind. The other guy, football player. And they met up with each other and struck, and he started helping out the blind person, you know, registering for classes and all of that. And they struck, in their conversation, the blind guy says, do you like to jog? And his friend, says, his fellow classmate says, yeah, I do. I usually do it before breakfast every morning. He said, well, I do too, but it's a little awkward for me. I need some help. Would you be open to that? So his friend that can see brings a rope, about 20, 25 feet long, ties it around his waist, ties it around his friend's waist, the blind man, and they go running around the track. Now, there were kind of funny stories. He leads them to the puddle or things like that. <laughs> and then the blind guy says to him, why don't you come over to the house tonight? We'll have a couple of beers and we'll just throw on a steak or something like that. And he says, fine. So they get to the house. The one that can see knocks on the door. He's got a six pack of beer. And he walks in to the apartment and it's in total darkness. And he yells out, where the hell are the lamps in this house? <laughs> and the response back is, oh, that's right. You people who can see need light to get around in the darkness. Think of that. The blind man encounters Jesus and he spits in the mud and wipes it in his eyes. Go and wash yourself in the pool of Siloam and he can see. Now there are two parts to both of these readings. Didn't get the answer to what's the most amazing thing about the Samaritan woman at the well. But here we are 2,000 plus years later talking about her and her five husbands that she had before. The most amazing thing in this gospel passage is that the blind man no one was excited that he could see. So where was the true blindness? And brothers and sisters, I think Lent is an opportunity for you and me to open our eyes and see clearly what's not going right and how we can address it. Whether it's in all the issues that other people mentioned before. There are people that would love to come to church and do not feel welcomed because we 
put conditions upon that. And what kind of hospitality do we offer if we invite people to come, but they can't eat with us? And so as we look at this, I just invite you in our preaching, and as St. Francis said, our most effective priest preaching, you know, as he sends his disciples out, he says, preach the gospel. If you have to, use words. And that's what Lent is all about for us. Less words and more actions in the name of Jesus. At this point, I'd just like to open it up for any reflections, if you want to throw stones, that's another gospel passage. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, listen, look, think of the gospels that we're going to hear during Lenten time. The woman caught in the act of adultery. The prodigal son. The good Samaritan. You know, when we look at all of these, the raising of Lazarus is two weeks from now. It's almost like Mary and Martha thought that they should get special treatment because of their friendship with Jesus. You know, there are some theologians that say that they wonder whether Lazarus was actually disabled. Lazarus never says a word. He's in the background, and we know nothing about him. Now, he may have two very talkative sisters. Well, certainly one, and the other one's doing all the work, but <laughs> nowhere do we see Lazarus saying anything. And we wonder why. So when we look at these scriptures, they're easy for us to understand. But what is Jesus trying to tell us? Open your, not just your minds to the Gospels of Lent, but open your hearts because the powerhouse in each of us is not the mind. The powerhouse in each of us, when it comes to compassion, is not the head, it is the heart. Mercy comes from the heart. Oh, I can talk mercy and all of that and then go into the office and start yelling at everybody. Not that I ever did that, but, <laughs> you know. and. And I leave this as well, and then after some comments, I just have one thing. But you know, the Holy Spirit, as I often shared with my staffs over the years, and did when I was in San Jose as Vicar for Evangelization, the Holy Spirit is always in the mess. The Holy Spirit is always in the confusion. The Holy Spirit is always present in the crisis. And the Holy Spirit was also present to us in COVID. And so when I hear people say, I can't wait to get back to the old normal, you know what? It's an illusion that the old normal was working. We have been hemorrhaging numbers in the youth and the young adults and in all of those marginalized groups, and when you take all those marginalized groups together, it's a hefty number. It hurts the brand. You know, so I mean, when we look at that, that's where the Holy Spirit, anytime we're struggling with something, the Holy Spirit is there. But if our heart is in the right place, we will discern what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us or call us to. I was dealing with a brother Paulus today that's been invited to move to a, another assignment as a pastor. And he says to me on the phone, since he feels good with me, he says, I'm always amazed how everybody else thinks I'm capable of doing so much more. But it makes me very anxious because I don't see that confidence in myself. And I said to him, well, take it from an older father. And I said, I remember what it was like when I started the Paulus Center for Evangelization in Portland, Oregon in 1979 in our old church and school building. 
After a while, I was almost afraid that what I got myself into could be a disaster. It wasn't. And I did such a great job in raising the funds and getting people to do everything for us out of the parish and others that they made me director of development for the Paulist Fathers. <laughs> and I always called that ministry friend raising. And I'd hear the stories of how Paulist touched them over the years. And then I became pastor of Old St. Mary's Cathedral and found out the building was not retrofitted and had to raise $11 million to retrofit the building with over 30 other houses of worship in the city and other General Assembly buildings. So everybody, then you realize how small San Francisco is. And from there I went to the bishop's cut. What am I going to do there? You know, working side by side with the bishops, the secretary for evangelization. And I shared with him, I said, you know, every time everyone else always thought it was a great idea, John, you'd be perfect for this. I had that anxiety, I told him. But I said, it's the Holy Spirit that was speaking through others. Sisters and brothers, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us in Lent. The worst thing we can ever do is let this Lent be just like all the others. Because I believe if we are on fire with the good news of Jesus Christ, we can be, as someone was saying before, you know, as a believer, you know, we're ridiculed. But Jesus also addresses that. You'll be persecuted, you know, and there'll be beatitudes as we listen to that, but I do believe if we can allow ourselves to be transformed into the good news itself as Jesus' disciples, that we can be the antidote to the darkness, the hatred, the division, and all that surrounds our society and even within our church. Because the last thing sometimes you want to go back, right back to where we were in the 60s, you don't want to talk about religion and politics at a family meal. So any uh, questions, reflections? Stephanie. Not a prize for the perfect, but powerful medicine for the weak. Yeah. Yes, Richard. How do you suggest that we as individuals, as disciples of Christ, as Holy Spirit, as a parish, we become more welcoming, more, how do we, how do we invite others to the well? How do we go out to be that face of Jesus and, and bring them in? What, how do we, you're an evangelist, so how, how what, what do you suggest, or what suggestions would you give us as individuals, disciples, but as a parish as well? Well, I think when we're witnessing to people beyond the doors of the church, I think we have to be what Francis, St. Francis, was talking about. You know, uh, one of his other great quotes is to do a, uh, an act of kindness for somebody. It may be the only homily or sermon they hear in the day. You know, and I think when we act first, then sometimes people will say, well, why, do you, why are you always so positive? Why are you always looking at the glass half full rather than half empty? You're always so kind with people. You know, when we exemplify what we believe, that's where the disciple piece comes in, because that's where the fire comes in. 
That's where the joy comes in, you know. In the joy of the gospel, Pope Francis has a great line, which I sometimes see this myself. He says, why is it when most Catholics are leaving church, they look like they just went to a funeral? That's a quote. You know, and I think that's part of it. You know, it's a Eucharistic celebration. And, you know, and we celebrate, you know, um, that. And I think, how do we then take that into our workplace? How do we, with our youth, say that there's no place for a Christian to be bullying someone else or making fun of someone that, you know, has, uh, has no hair and then they find out later after they've ridiculed them for a while that the, the fellow student's going through chemo. You know, we always need to try and put ourselves in the shoes of the sandals of someone else before we're quick to judge and we don't know what's going on in their lives. And I think it's how do we bring that joy? People don't want to come to a sad institution. It's like I was doing parish planning for a very large church up in San Mateo two years ago. And even before that, when I, before I got too busy and came down to San Jose, the pastor said, well, John, you know, with evangelization in your background, what would you, I said, for God's sakes, Mike, cut your masses. <laughs> fully residential community. And he said, oh, I can't touch the masses, especially the first one. That's where I get most of the money from. <laughs> you know, there's a counterpoint to that. I said, I can do arithmetic very well. Five masses on the weekend and your church seats 1,100 people. No one of your masses has more than 250, and that would be only one mass. And I said, but new people moving into this parish, when you want to talk about additional funds, moving into this parish, what do they see when they come into that church? They see the 800 empty seats and say, this place is dying. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we do have a branding, because even in this diocese, most churches can cut their schedules back. But, you know, I did that at Old St. Mary's Cathedral when I was pastor. We cut them in half. We created an hour and a half between the two morning masses, and everybody was bitching about it until they started coming to it. They saw people, because, you know, 60% of our congregation were tourists. And <laughs> not now, but, you know, that's what it was. But they began to see other parishioners that they knew and all of a sudden, things changed. I think in leadership, and I dealt with this at our parish council meeting about prophetic leadership, sometimes we need to go out on a limb for the right decision. And that's what prophetic leadership is about. And I think that's the challenge sometimes is many of our parishes across the US are all, and you know, Europe, they're empty. You know, um, of course, there's a church on every block. So, I mean, you know, when you get to Rome, I mean, there's several churches just in Vatican City. <laughs> you know. But I think, you know, that's the challenge is how to move from maintenance to mission. And what I share with clergy and pastoral councils is it takes a lot more energy for maintenance than it does for mission. Because when we're in a maintenance mode, the issues control us. So. Yes, uh, one more. So how do, how do you peacefully protest the, um, the 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 I think the best person to ask that is Pope Francis. He's trying to make a paradigm shift because he knows that some of our rules and regulations, like in Leviticus, in the Jewish time, even today, um, 
are stifling people. And it's about embracing people in the complexity of their lives, not where we want them, but to then accompany them, to have that encounter with someone as the face of Jesus. We may disagree with everything about their lives, but then through the accompaniment, something begins to happen. And so people we have respected have done just that, and not through a bureaucratic way. I remember Mother St. Teresa of Calcutta, known to us as Mother Teresa. And a, when her community was just growing in great numbers, and a journalist said to her over in India, she says, Mother, why do you do this? Lifting the dying out of the, the gutters of the street or the abandoned babies. And she says, because any time I look into the face of someone else, I see the face of Jesus, and that's why I do it. And she looks at the journalist and says, and what would you do? <laughs> Not that she was looking for the answer, but to say something. And even long before St. Teresa of Calcutta, St. Benedict, the rule of the Benedictines, one of their vows is one of hospitality. And that meant that when you open the door and it's a stranger, no matter who they are, your relationship has changed by opening the door. They are now a guest. And you afford them the hospitality that you would do. The hospitality, I think, more so today, comes from our hearts. And yet I think so many people are shut down or it has become so overwhelming and painful that the complacency enters in or as someone was sharing before or you're ridiculed for reaching out. I mean, that's the division in the church. But you know, in Jesus' time, there was a lot of division among the disciples, especially when Paul went out to the Gentile world and the rule was that everybody, all male converts, had to go through circumcision. Well, that rule got changed very quickly. You know, so I think when we look at those things, I think there are ways that we gradually change. But I think in our parishes, it's getting new people involved. And it, by all means, it means getting the young people involved. And as I've said so often, as others in the room would know, that on a pastoral council, you need to have young adults on the pastoral council so they can speak to these issues. They're products of a secularized society. I'm a product of a schizophrenic age from the Baltimore Catechism through the 60s. And, you know, and as some young priests want to go back to some of that, I say to myself, I've been there once. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> You know, I know what a pre-Vatican II church was. It's more than liturgy. So it's, uh, let me just close with this prayer. I think a lot of what I'm speaking about comes from Francis's encyclical on uh, fraternity and social friendship, Fratelli Tutti. So I'd just like to use the closing prayer. So let us pray. Lord, Father of our human family, you created all things, all human beings, equal in dignity. Pour forth into our hearts a fraternal spirit and inspire in us a dream of a renewed encounter, dialogue, justice, and peace. Move us to create healthier societies and a more dignified world, a world without hunger, poverty, violence, and war. May our hearts be open to all the peoples and nations of the earth. May we recognize the goodness and beauty that you have sown in each of us and then forge bonds of unity, common products, projects, and shared dreams. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. Before we close the evening, I'd like to thank Father Hurley for reminding all of us of the importance of that encounter, that encounter with the face of Christ that makes us really a true disciple of the risen Lord. And in turn, we, during this Lent, may we encounter not only the face of Christ, but also his love, 
the unconditional love, the compassion, and the mercy that the Lord continues to extend to, to each one of us. Also, thank you to all of you for being here this evening. Next week, next Thursday, we'll continue with our Lenten Soup Suppers. But next week, we will shift from talks to praise and worship. Richard and Eric will be leading us with the praise and worship next week in the church. So I invite all of you once again to, to join us next Thursday at 6 o'clock for soup. And then we'll continue with, with praise and worship in, in the church. Have a wonderful